Hey guys, my name is Trevor Sullivan and welcome back to my video channel. Thank you so much for joining me for yet another video as part of my Rust programming playlist. Now, in the last video, we had studied how to create our own custom user-defined structs. So we created a vehicle example, we created a person example, and things of that nature. We also took a look at how to use a tuple-based struct in order to create a custom type here as well. But the struct itself is just a representation of an object and the object's current state. So if we look at something like a vehicle, let's say that the vehicle starts out with a color of red as a field. Well, if we ever painted that car or put some kind of wrap on that car to make it look all fancy, we might actually want to change the color from red to blue or something like that. Now, typically these behaviors, these kind of mutations in our various structs that we define as part of an application are going to be mutated by what are known as methods. Methods are really simple to understand, and that's the topic that we're going to be focusing on in this particular video, to basically take these structs that we've defined and then figure out how to attach these behaviors to them using methods. Now, in Rust terminology, they're kind of referred to as methods in the documentation. If we take a look at that right over here, it's down under section 5.3 in the Rust programming language book right here. But if you look a little bit further down in the documentation here, you'll actually see that there is a term called associated functions, and it says all functions defined within an impl block, which we'll look at in a few moments, are called associated functions because they're associated with the type that comes directly after the impl keyword. So basically what we do in our Rust modules is we define this block of code called an implementation or impl for short block. And that basically allows us to declare the methods that we want to attach to a particular type inside of Rust. And we can attach those methods to the types that we define our own custom user defined types, such as vehicles, people, and any other kind of real world object that you want to represent in your Rust code. Now, before we jump into the demonstration here in our code editor, make sure that you head over to my YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Trevor Sullivan. Make sure that you subscribe to my channel to help me grow this community as I am an independent content creator. Also, please like the video if you learned anything by watching the end of this. And also please share a link to this video or even to the Rust programming tutorial playlist with your friends, family, and anyone else who you think might be interested in learning the Rust programming language. I've also got other other playlists on my YouTube channel on topics like low code platforms, LXD virtualization on Linux, open source software in general, PowerShell automation, and even cloud platforms such as Amazon Web Services. So we're going to dive into our code and actually take a look at how to implement these methods on our custom structs. So what we're going to do is actually just build on top of what we did in the last video. So if you're just jumping into this video for the first time, you can learn about how to define structs and enumerations in the last video in my playlist. So what we're going to do is take these things like vehicles or persons, and we're going to define some behaviors on these structs. And we might have to kind of mutate these structs a little bit to add some new fields in order for us to kind of make some sensible methods to mutate these data structures. So for starters here, let's take a look at the vehicle struct, all right? So a vehicle is a pretty well understood object, right? It has a manufacturer, a model, a ma manufacturing year, and typically a color. Sometimes they could be multicolor if they're two-tone or have vehicle wraps, but just to keep things relatively simple, we have an enumeration up here that predefines certain allowed colors for vehicles in our application. And of course, we could always add to that enumeration if there's new colors that we want to offer to the users of our Rust application. So what we'll do is 
go ahead and define a method on this vehicle type. I'm not going to add any other fields right now, but I've, let's say that we want to take this color field and we actually want to turn it from one color into a different color, right? So the way that we do this is by attaching a method to the struct that defines the behavior we want to implement. And we do that with the impl block that we just saw in the Rust documentation. So first, what we're going to do here is specify the impl keyword. This is a keyword that you'll want to get intimately familiar with in Rust. And then what we do right after this is specify the data type in Rust that we want to implement methods for. So we'll just do the vehicle right down here. And then we'll open and close our curly braces. Inside of this implementation block, this is where we can define methods, which are basically just functions that we want to attach to instances of a vehicle. Now, there's kind of two different ways that we can attach our methods. One is commonly known in other programming languages as a static method, and the other type is known as an instance method. And the Rust documentation doesn't always refer to them in that exact terminology, but essentially to give you an idea here, a static method is something that we implement on the struct itself. And this doesn't refer to a specific vehicle. It's not saying, you know, person A's vehicle or person B's vehicle or person C's vehicle. We're just talking about the concept of a vehicle blueprint, which is what the struct definition is. So oftentimes static methods will allow you to kind of operate on any vehicle type or anything that looks similar to a vehicle. And so what we can do is either determine if the method's going to be static or instance level. Now, if the method is going to be instance level, our function signature is going to look just a little bit different. So let's do a function here called paint. So we're going to paint the car from one color to a different color, right? And so inside of this function body right here, what we want to do is set the color of the vehicle instance to something different. But how do we refer to the vehicle that we're operating on? Well, in order to implement an instance method that actually operates on a specific vehicle that we've instantiated in our Rust code, what we need to do is specify the first parameter of our associated function with the input argument of ampersand self, which is a reference to the current object that we are operating on. So this is an instance function because it is, or instance method, I should say, because it has this input parameter declared. But we'll take a look at static methods a little bit later on. So basically what we want to do is we want to refer to this self variable because that will refer to the vehicle instance that we are trying to mutate. And as you can see right here, self is automatically interpreted as a pointer to a vehicle because we are implementing this function inside of the vehicle type. The Rust compiler just automatically knows that self refers to whatever data type we're declaring this implementation block on. So inside of this function body, what we want to do is say self dot color equals whatever color we want to paint the vehicle. Now, we'd also have to pass in a second parameter here. So our second parameter could be the color that we want to paint the vehicle. So let's call this new color, and we'll set the type of new color to the vehicle color enumeration that predefines these different values because our data structure here has already declared that the color field must be of type vehicle color. So we'll go ahead and plug in vehicle color here, and then we'll set the self.color field on the current struct instance that we're operating on to whatever the new color variable or input argument is, right? So this is going to allow us to change the color based on whatever the color specifies as an input argument. Now you can see that we get an error right here and we actually expected to get this because we can not overwrite the data because we don't have a mutable reference to the vehicle instance, right? So when we do ampersand self, that's a pointer to a vehicle, but that's a read only reference. It is not a mutable reference where we can actually alter the vehicle. So when we want a method to mutate a particular object, we need to make sure that we do ampersand mute and then specify the self keyword so that we can pass in the vehicle.
Now, as you can see, we still get a warning here because it's saying that the paint method is never actually being referenced. So let's go ahead and attempt to call this method that we've just defined called paint on our vehicle type. So let's find a method where we created a vehicle. So right down here, we have this function called new vehicle. I meant function, not method, <laughs> getting those terminologies mixed up. And there's a little bit of ambiguity there. But we have this function here that's creating a new vehicle, and it's returning that vehicle back to the caller. Now, everything is being initialized here. So we're initializing the manufactured Porsche, the model to 911, the manufacturing year to 1991, and the vehicle color is green. So let's say that we want to mutate this vehicle and change the color. Well, as soon as we do V1 right here to reference the vehicle object that we've instantiated, you can actually see right here in the auto completion that the paint method is automatically available because the Rust IntelliSense, the Rust Analyzer, knows that we've declared this paint method on any vehicle instance. So we'll just say v1.paint, and then we can actually autocomplete all of these values too, because again, Rust Analyzer knows that the color that we paint the vehicle must be a vehicle color type within that enumeration. So we can just do control space in VS Code, and then we could choose a different color like white. So as you can see, we are getting a error here because we have not specified that this V1 variable that we are initializing is mutable. So in this case, what we need to do is say, let mute V1 equal this new vehicle instance. And that will make V1 a mutable reference to the vehicle that we've instantiated. So then when we try to call a method that causes the object to mutate, then we can go ahead and call it successfully without getting any compiler errors. Now, the reason that the Rust compiler knew that we needed to specify the V1 variable as mutable, if you recall, is because on the paint method that we implemented right up here, as part of the function signature, we specified that it's a mutable pointer to self. So when we tried to call the paint method on that object, Rust automatically knew that we were mutating v1 based on the function signature's declaration. And since it saw that v1 was not marked as mutable, it went ahead and threw the error indicating that we couldn't mutate a, an object that was not, or a variable that was not marked as mutable. Let's go ahead and give this code a try. So we'll come back over to our main file and we wanna call this new vehicle method, I think. Actually, it's gonna be create vehicle here because this is a publicly exposed function that ultimately calls new vehicle under the hood. All right, so let's do create vehicle. Go ahead and save this. And then down here, let's do a cargo run. And as you can see, the result here is that our Porsche is now set to the color white instead of the default initialized value, which was green. So that's how we can implement an instance level method that causes our data structures that we've instantiated to mutate one or more of the fields on that struct. Now, we also talked about cell types back in the video about structs. So if you don't want to make a mutable reference to the vehicle type or the vehicle instance, I should say, then you could declare one of those fields as a cell type and wrap that field in a cell so that you can use the set method on the cell to change the underlying value of that specific data field. But we're just taking a look at how to directly mutate the field, which has an underlying type of vehicle color, which is our enumeration that we created for that specific purpose, right? So let's talk about the other type of method, which is a static method. So we'll go back under our implementation block right here for vehicle. But this time, we're just going to do things a little bit differently. And you might be wondering, well, when would I use a static method versus an instance method? Well, the vast majority of the time, I think people are going to be referring to instance methods when they talk about methods, because in general terminology, you are going to be mutating instances of objects. And so that's when we use an instance level method to cause that object or one of the fields in that object to change. 
So the static methods are very useful, but there's a really common pattern called, I think they call it the factory pattern or something like that. I'm sure there's lots of different names you could use for it, but what we can do is actually declare a method on the vehicle type itself that's not bound to the individual vehicle instances. And we can then construct a new vehicle by simply calling this static method or in Rust terminology, an associated function on that type rather than calling the method on the instance of that type. So let's do about create vehicle here. Now we already have a function in our module called create vehicle right down here. So don't get it confused with that. But what we're going to do is bind this create vehicle method to the vehicle type so that rather than having to call a totally separate function, we'll actually have a create vehicle function that is directly associated with our vehicle type. And in my opinion, it's a lot nicer to have static methods declared on your custom types rather than declaring a totally separate function at the module level, because when other developers are consuming your library in Rust, it just makes it a lot more obvious to those developers that your implementation of this function is specifically designated to be used on vehicle types. Whereas my module level create vehicle function here, it's not necessarily directly obvious to somebody that I am using this to create a vehicle. And even if I was creating a vehicle, it doesn't really specify what vehicle type is being created because I don't have a return type declared right here. And it's just not quite as friendly because it's not directly associated. So by directly associating create vehicle here, we can just say let new vehicle equal. And then we'll just go ahead and instantiate our vehicle struct here inside of this method. Let's put a semicolon at the end. Then we can do manufacturer equals maybe default. We could specify the model as default. We could specify the year as 1990. And the color will just default to how about blue. OK, so after we instantiate this vehicle here, also we need to make sure that we call dot two string on each of these here. We'll do two string and two string because those are capital S data types and I have an equal sign instead of a colon. So let's go ahead and fix that syntax there as well. And I think everything checks out now. So as you can see, the new vehicle variable contains a new vehicle. And then what we want to do is return that vehicle back to the caller. So we'll return the new vehicle variable here. And we also need to declare that we are returning a vehicle type back to the caller. Now, as you can see in this particular example here, our static method or associated function does not have any input arguments. So what we're doing is just initializing these different fields of our data structure to some kind of sane default values so that the intent of this object is clear to the caller, whoever's creating this object. But we don't necessarily know if the caller of this function is going to want a Porsche, a Hyundai, a Honda, a Toyota. We don't really know what they want to do. So the easiest way to create a new vehicle is just to call it with no input arguments. And then you get a vehicle and you can always mutate that vehicle later on if you need to. But we could also provide other functions that allow us to accept different input arguments where we could actually take things like manufacturer as a string input argument and then initialize these values on the new vehicle to the values that were passed in by the caller. All right, so let's go ahead and try this out. Let's go back down to our public function here that's being called by main.rs. And then what we'll do is just comment this out right here where we're calling to uh, new vehicle right here. And instead of calling new vehicle, we're going to say let my vehicle equal. And then we'll do the vehicle type and we'll do double colon. We use a double colon to refer to these static methods that don't take an instance as the self input argument. And then we'll just call create vehicle. So it's literally that simple. Just note that when we call a static method versus an instance level method, we use double colons for the static method. And then we use a period to call 
the instance method like right up here where we call the paint method. So this is effectively doing the same thing. We're just initializing a vehicle and then we are printing the details of that vehicle. Let's go ahead and do a cargo run here and see what we get back. And sure enough, right down here, you can see that our newly initialized vehicle has a manufacturer of default, model default, year 1990, and a color of blue. But again, because we've instantiated this vehicle and we've declared the paint method on it, we can do my vehicle dot paint and then simply specify a color that we want to paint the vehicle, like white. Let's see, vehicle color white, there it is. And of course, we need to turn this into a mutable reference as well, because paint is mutating this vehicle here. And then if we run this code again, you can now see that our default car has changed to white. So feel free to be creative with these different types of methods. Just remember that there is the static method type that doesn't take any input arguments, and that's bound directly to the vehicle type. But then we also have the instance level methods that allow us to declare self, whatever the current instances that you're dealing with of a vehicle, and you can actually mutate the vehicle itself inside of there. Now, let's say that we wanted to do something else. So like person, right? So we've got a person type down here. And let's say that we wanted to do something like miles walked. Okay, so this is going to track the entire lifetime of a person. And we're going to see how many miles that person has walked. Or maybe to be a little bit more precise, we could say meters walked. It's really up to you what kind of data type you want to use for that, or a unit of measure, I should say. But let's just go ahead and do uh, unsigned. Let's do a 32-bit integer, see what the max value of a U32 is. I think it'll tell us if I hover over this. At least it does sometimes. But anyways, let's say that we wanted to have a person walk, right? Well, we can do essentially the same thing as what we did with the vehicle type. But first, because we have changed the data structure of the struct and added a new field, we have to make sure that we find any references to the person and make sure that we are initializing meters walked. So at the very end here where we instantiate a person, I'm just going to say meters walked is initially a zero. Go ahead and save that. Go ahead and run it. And sure enough, it works fine. But let me make sure that I'm also calling the function where we create a person. So we've got our pub fn test create new person or test create person, I should say. So let's just uncomment this line here and we'll comment out the create vehicle line. And there you go. It says first name Shannon, last name Sullivan, birth month six, birth, the birth year 1986. And that is happening because we are mutating that value here. So let's comment that out just so I have myself in there. And then let's also tack on, um, let's actually remove these here and just say miles or meters walked and then specify an input arg. We'll do first name, last name, and then my person dot meters walked. All right. So if we run this, now you can see we've got Trevor Sullivan meters walked zero. So now what we want to do is implement a method, an instance level method on each individual person that we instantiate so that a person can walk a certain distance, right? So what we'll do is create yet another implementation block right down here, and we're going to be implementing methods on the person type. So we specify person there, and then we can do a function called walk, and we'll do a mutable reference to self. And we also want to accept an input argument that specifies how many meters we want to walk. And we could even be more specific and specify walk meters, because then if we wanted to have another method called walk miles or walk feet or other types of units of measure, we could define other methods on this same person type. But for now, we'll just do walk meters and then we'll say meters colon u32. And then what we'll do is take self dot meters walked, and we'll simply add the meters input argument to self right here. So let's go ahead and save this. We also need to specify our lifetime here because we have a lifetime declaration on our person type right up here. Actually, I'm going to simplify things by just getting rid of that. We'll just use a regular string right here and then get rid of that. 
And then we'll have to also remove that from our new person function here. And we also need to call cell from Trevor dot to string instead, because we want a string type. Actually, I think I removed the cell. So let's remove the cell there, save that. And now it works just fine. And then we also have a reference to the cell down here. So we're just going to remove the get method that uses the cell and just refer directly to the first name string value. All right, I think I fixed everything here. So now what we want to do is test this walk meters function that we have not yet used anywhere. So what we'll do down here in test create person, we'll just do let my person equal a new person, and then we'll do my person. We want to make sure we have a mutable reference to my person because again, we're mutating the person object or instance that we have. And we'll do my person dot walk meters. You can see we've got this nice auto completion here that shows us the function signature that we need to pass in. So we'll do walk meters and just specify something like eight meters, do a colon, and then we'll say walk another 12 meters. So we should get 20 when we run this. So we'll do cargo run. And sure enough, right down here, you see Trevor Sullivan walked 20 meters. So feel free to be creative and implement whatever kind of logical methods it is that you need to mutate your objects. Uh, you know, if you're thinking of things in kind of gaming ter terminology, you could create something like a struct of character, like the person's character who's playing the game. And then you could have something like hit points, right? So we could do something like struct character and then do, you know, hit points as an unsigned, you know, 32 bit integer. And then we could have a character type field here that refers to some enumeration that specifies a character type, which I think we actually already declared further up here, right here, where we have mage, warrior, wizard, and archer. So then you could implement, you know, some methods on the character type that, you know, decrease hit points if the character is struck by another character or attacked by some kind of monster or something like that. So again, just think of your application that you're trying to build. Try to kind of think of what logical objects, what kind of structs you should implement, and then what kind of behaviors you want implemented on those various data types. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and learned at least one thing new. Again, please leave a like, subscribe to the channel to help me grow this community and produce more content for you, and share a link with all of your friends. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you in the next video. Take care.